<laughs> Who's that? No. Cher. She did like two or three. Oh. I'm never playing again. <laughs> She's going to be here tonight. We'll be doing some of her early tunes, like her version of All I Really Want to Do by Dylan. Bang, bang, the baby shot me down. And, uh, I love those records. I have all those albums. Sonny Bono produced them. They have that kind of like Phil Spector production thing, because he had worked with Spector and kind of copied that production. And was she did a lot of covers of uh, songs that were out at that time, like uh, Remember Tell or No by the Zombies. Yep. But, when she did know. tell no. him no. She did that? She did her version okay. of that oh same gosh. song, but they changed the title. Her and Sonny did tell him no. I love oh. Baby Don't Go, you know, I'm the big hit mm -hmm. for Sonny and Cher. I mm -hmm. love that. It's one of my all time favorite singles. I love that record. I have about 10,000 oh. favorite 45. So if there's time there, I'd like to run those down, starting at number 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a little break at 5,000 so we can, you know, get a coffee or something. <laughs> I can remember them all good fact, I you. think by then, by, by 5,000, I think they'll be uh, escorting us out the door and <laughs> locking up. We'll get this. Um, the reviews of your, of your dozens of recordings have spanned comparisons to The Beatles, Alex Chilton, Marsha Crenshaw, and even newer bands like Wilco. You're being compared to Wilco, or Wilco's being compared to you. No, well, what actually, do you think of these comparisons? They started before, well, Wilco, before Wilco was Uncle Tupelo, of course, and then it they both, Wilco and Sunbolt, came on a Uncle Tupelo. I loved, they were at Folk I loved Fest Uncle, last year. Yeah, I loved Uncle Tupelo, and I love Wilco and Sunbolt. Yeah. Those guys, Jeff Tweedy, Jay Farrar, and then on the, And I love the Anodyne album, that last the Uncle Tupelo album that they did. Remember that tour they did? I saw them at the Iron Horse when they did the, the Anodyne tour, and that was really great. Joe Henry opened for them, it was great. But, um, uh, I like them a lot. Yeah, I like both games. Wilco are very adventurous. And they, you know, they have that wild guitar player that they know is wild stuff. Now the Beatles, that's a different story than those guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was one of those kids, I mean, like a lot of people, I mean, obviously, sit and watch Ed Sullivan that first time they were on, sitting on the floor in the living room, you know. Fortunately, <clears throat> I mean, we only got like three channels on the TV. We lived in the housing project. We had the rabbit ears, the VHF thing. You have to get up and move it all around to the get one channel. In there. They just got rid of the rabbit ears. <clears throat> we're standing like there last holding, year, right? <laughs> stand there physically holding something while you're looking at the screen. Don't move. That's tin good. foil. Right yep, the tin foil. I, I was the one that like had that to do just it. for about a half hour for the show. I can do it. I can do it. I'll get you a soda, okay? But um, at Sullivan, you know, we. We watched it anyway every week, my parents, my sister, and I. So I was fortunate enough to get to see that show when it happened and just changed everything. Do you remember some of the artists that were on the Ed Sullivan show that made their debuts? Well, back then, the thing about the Ed Sullivan show was that uh, he didn't have like all the TV and videos and the, and, the, and the computers and the YouTube and all that stuff where you could see people. You bought the records and you had picture sleeves and you had magazines and that. But uh, you get to see most of these groups. They were lip syncing in most of the shows where the Beatles played live on the Ed Sullivan shows. But um, you never got to see them perform on TV except for shows like that. Right. So it was the only time you would get to see it. And yeah. you didn't have TV on 24 hours a day. I don't know <laughs> if you're familiar with high flight, you know, the airplane going off mm -hmm. and that was mm -hmm. over. Snow on the screen. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, when, uh, way back when I lived alone, I, <clears throat> I had a little TV, and I remember coming back home from so many gigs just in time to turn the TV on. There's high flight coming. The next thing I know is I'm falling asleep, and I get up, and all I see is static. It's like between two and six a.m. or yeah. something. Was yeah, it, exactly. Is that the test pattern? Yeah, the test pattern. The color. Too. Well, once color TV came in, the striping. They yeah. had the big circle test pattern. Yeah, those were the days when they could actually watch a test pen for an hour and be entertained. <laughs> Especially if we had. And, and then little. figure out for an hour. And then you'd get tired of the show. It was reality TV before its time. I was playing at a club the other night in West Bridgewater, and they had the sports on in these two TVs in the room where I was playing. Then the minute I started playing, the TVs went closed circuit to you. <clears throat> so you were on the TVs. And oh my gosh. I didn't know that. No one told me. And I'm playing. These people were there I knew. I'm not just making it up. There were like, you know, 10 people. 
<laughs> You'll think I'm bragging. Or <laughs> sure, sure, 10 people came to see it. But um, when they realized I'm looking at the screen, I'm trying not to look at the screen. I'm playing, you know, and I kept thinking, what kind of like absurd reality TV show is this? Guy playing in every club. But watching the Beatles was something else. I mean, I like totally changed everything for tons of people have that same story, musicians that they sat down and watched that show when it came on and the next day they were never the same. If you, if you didn't have a guitar, you wanted to go get a guitar, you wanted to all of a sudden just sing tunes, but you wanted to write songs. And I was already into records because that was like 1960, uh, <clears throat> when were they on Solomon? Three or four? Was it four? February 64? I should know this date. I was too young. I was born in '62. I was too young to see that, but I do remember you guys are my siblings. <laughs> well, she's more of a kid than I am. I'm old. Sixty-seven. Yeah. <laughs> so I started buying records in 1959, basically when I was nine years old. So I was already buying. I had tons of singles. But before the Beatles came out, and a few albums, and uh, the Beach Boys had come out before. Mm -hmm. and Dwayne Eddy and Sam Cooke, the Everly Brothers, all these people I listened to, and bought records by. So I was heavily into music before the Beatles came along. Beatles. They did change everything. Right from that night on, before that night, like when the, like I Want to Hold Your Hand came out, it wasn't their first record, it was the first one that became huge in the United no, States. I, I know you so, did great this time. Everybody just went out and bought those records. I had my little record player in my room and just played that record over and over in the B-sides. How was the sound different? <coughs> than what do you mean? Things? How, why did that? Why did they change everything? What was the sound? What did you hear that was so different? Though? It sounded really fresh, you know, and yeah. different. Yeah. And, and you can hear it now even when you listen to those records. I mean, listen even to like She Loves You. It's huge. That sound is huge. And, and it was very unlike. You could hear all their influences in it, but um, it was totally the wrong thing. Like it was fresh sounding. And then when you saw them on TV, with their hair, I mean, it wasn't like this length, like, but. It, at the time, it was considered long. You know? Yeah. And so the way they looked, and they had tons of uh, charisma, I would say, you know, for sure. And, uh, they they came along at just the right time, but they were they were basically uh, I wouldn't say they lucked out, but they were fortunate enough that Brian Epstein. I have, I, I thought about this many many times because I'm very into this kind of stuff, like how Brian Epstein finally walked from his store to the cavern during one of those lunchtime shows <clears throat> and the Beatles were playing because now people started coming into his store and asking for that Mike Bond record that Tony Sheridan recorded and the Beatles were back in the band. So it's a Tony Sheridan with the Beat Brothers, didn't even say Beatles on it. And the Beatles at that point were the number one band in Liverpool, they had worked their way up. And, um, and uh, he found out that they were playing at the cavern a lot, which was like I've been to Liverpool and I traced those steps, you know, it was like three blocks distance of like walking from here, maybe the mystery train records, you know. That's wow. from Brian Epstein's store to the cavern. So during lunchtime, I often I often consider that to be the turning point, a turning point in the rock and roll. His walk there and back. People don't think about that, I don't think. Yeah, they all want to walk Abbey Road. Well no, but they <laughs> well no, they think about the music end of it, which is extremely important, like, you know, the Beatles have the sound and the other thing, but people don't realize that Brian Epstein, who basically was put in charge of his uh, parents' store and ran the record department, he liked classical music and jazz, he really wasn't into rock and roll and pop stuff, but he was like a walking encyclopedia of, like, records, he had to stop for his store, and he was trying to get a record, any record anyone wanted to order, because most of the musicians in Liverpool listened to American music. You know, Little Richard, Emily Brothers, Elvis, uh, yeah. Buddy Holly, all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, and so, after he seen there was some interest in this single that the Beatles played back up on, he had to order more copies, I guess. And, and he found out they were playing like three blocks away. Oh yeah, they're at the cavern. You know, so there he goes, traips over to the cavern. He's going to see Phil and Ty. <clears throat> Not like I was there by any means, but... Um, <laughs> And they noticed them supposedly in the crowd because it was like younger people, younger crowd. They were wearing all black leather at the time, black leather pants, jackets. And, uh, and they made some joke about him being there or something, you know, oh, Mr. Epstein's here or something. I don't know. Put him on the spot. But um, he was with his assistant there, Alice Gare, somebody who worked in the store with him. 
and um, supposedly on the way back, when they walked back to the store, he said, what do you think of these guys? And he said, oh, they're very good. And he said, yeah, I think, uh, he said, I think they're great. You know? And um, then he said, uh, you know, I think I, I'd like to manage them. You know, I think it was shocking because the guy who never managed a band and never even liked rock and roll or pop. Wow. And then hooked up with them and had a meeting with them and ended up managing them, oh, talked them into wearing suits so that he can get you more gigs and better paying gigs if you wear a suit. Because initially, I guess, when he said, I want you guys to wear suits, they went, you're crazy, we're out of here. We're not going to turn in our black leather. But, um, but he did, he kept his word. And then every week he would take demos of theirs and put on that train to, to London. He would beat on every door in London every record label in England to try to get him a record deal. And, um, finally, he did get one with EMI. Everybody turned them down. So he would come back every week and they would wait for him. And always would be the same news from what I hear. I'm just relaying this story. Yeah. It's always totally intrigued me. And then... Um, Bet you they regretted that. <laughs> you no, know, he was like their saving the race, I think, because I really believe to this day that as good as they were, they had the sound and everything. I think without him coming along, they wouldn't have break, broken out of Liverpool. I don't think there was any other person in Liverpool that could have got a label interested in them because he ran that record store. It's mostly it was the largest record store in the north of England. So all the labels in London, if you had said, oh, I, I, mean, I'm, I want you to listen to this band from Liverpool, normally they would go, get out of here. You know, they didn't want to hear or have anything to do with northern England. And, but he said, oh, that's Brian Epstein. Runs NEMS, the largest record store in the North America, sells our records. Oh, we should listen to this thing. Because of that, I think that's why he got listened to. And finally, EMI gave him a recording deal. And then, amazingly enough, double whammy, they go, Oh, we're going to put him with this guy, George Martin, to produce it. He does comedy records and classical music. So there they are with a producer that doesn't do rock and roll or pop. They got a manager that was never interested in it. And the whole thing was fit like a Parts of an amazing 